Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby declare open the fifth meeting of the 24th session of the Human Rights Council. Colleagues, we shall now proceed with the panel discussion on human rights of children of parents sentenced to the death penalty or executed with a particular focus on the ways and means to ensure the full enjoyment of their human rights. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Sandra Jones. She is an associate professor in the sociology department at the Rowan University located in Glasgow, New Jersey. I also would like to underline that she is uh, also a licensed clinical social worker with a dozen years of experience as a mental health and substance abuse therapist. Dr. Jones will discuss the negative impact of the imposition and carrying out of the death penalty on the human rights of children of parents sentenced to death. Dr. Jones, you have the floor. No. Okay. Good morning. Okay. I'd like to start by thanking um, the Office of the High Commissioner for the invitation to speak with you about the grief and trauma found among children of death row inmates in the United States. Thank you to each of you for your attendance as well and your concern about this important issue. Many of the same concerns you hear from the other panelists today about the children in their countries are also found to exist among the children I have been working with in the United States. There are particular issues that I found to exist among these children of death row inmates as well as whose parents have been executed that further demand our attention. From the time of their parents' arrest, through to the execution of their parent, these children are cast into an incredibly agonizing form of grief that is unlike any other. I must pause to note that while we do not know, as it has been noted, the exact scope of the issue in terms of numbers of children who are affected, it's important to add, while we are going to be talking primarily about the children of death row inmates, other children are also impacted, including younger siblings, nieces and nephews, and grandchildren to name a few of the family members of children, um, children of death row inmates. Although you will be hearing me primarily talk about the children, um, uh, the parents of the, um, the children have parents on death row. And you may hear me also refer to fathers because in the United States the vast majority of those on death row are men. There are a handful of women. These children feel terribly alone and stigmatized due to all of the publicity generated within the highly sensationalized media by their father's case. Therefore, they tend to isolate themselves from their peers and even for, from the rest of the family as they conceive the pain um, within their family and do not wish to bring them any further pain. This has often been referred to as disenfranchised grief and that they're disenfranchised from their own grief and that they're not permitted to express it within society and even within their own family uh, because of the internalized shame that comes with their experience. Ch these children find it incredibly painful and difficult to have a meaningful relationship with their father given the numerous obstacles imposed by the prison, such as the glass that divides them during their visits in the maximum security area of the prison. Typically, there is no contact with, um, with death row inmates when they visit. And again, no privacy as well. It is um, typically the case that these children are allowed, not allowed to visit their parent or their loved one on death row without an adult presence. So they lack privacy in terms of um, visits alone with their parent. These barriers make it extremely difficult for the children to maintain a healthy relationship with their father. When it comes to their performance in school, they have difficulty concentrating. No supports in the school system is in place for these children, or very few. And it also often becomes a place where they feel like they must fight to defend their father's reputation, and by extension, their own. Many children have found this challenge to exist even within the teachers and their classrooms. For instance, teachers may have classes where they instruct uh, lessons about the death penalty and they will put pictures up of their parent or loved one on death row and um, the children in, present in the classroom are not permitted to acknowledge their loved one without receiving a great deal of stigma. The children constantly feel uneasy if not living in fear as they await the news of their, that their father will be killed by the state so it's a form of anticipatory grief that they go through. And this grief is complicated by the numerous appeals and stays given to their loved one. 
which sets the children along with the family on this emotional roller coaster. <laughs> a lack of information is often given, not given to the child because they, the older family members wish to protect the children from the um, news that their father may be executed. So if the child is not aware of this appeals process, they may feel rejected by their parent because the father may start to withdraw from the child as an attempt to protect them. Saddened by each of the milestones that they reach when their father is unable to share in that milestone with them, it sets off a, a type of grief or loss called non-finite loss where it has a never-ending um, aspect to it. They feel guilty about sharing happy events with their father because they know it's going to make their father sad that they can't share them with them. And they want to protect their father so they don't often share um, bad events as well. So it makes the communication that they have with their parent or their loved one on death row very superficial. Many times these children have lost uh, a loved one to murder because as we know, murder oftentimes occurs within families among loved ones. For instance, many of the men on death row that I've worked with and their families are guilty of killing their um, spouse or significant other. And so the child is left highly conflicted as they try to grieve both of these losses at the same time. And oftentimes they're made to feel like they must choose between these losses, even from people within their own family. Perhaps the uh, mother who was murdered, her family does not wish the child to have contact with the father, for instance. So they may try and have a relationship with their parent on death row, um, but they will do so in secret without um, others knowing and without even being able to visit the father as well. So that disenfranchisement I referred to earlier oftentimes occurs even within the family when the murder has been within the family. These children become disillusioned about the role of the state. You know, as young children, they may be taught the state is there to protect them and have... Um, legislation and um, created that is going to make them safe. But they have this incredible sense of um, disillusionment because they no longer feel safe and their ideals of justice may be shattered. They experience a loss of security and loss of their hopes, dreams, and ideals, which has been referred to a loss of the assumptive world. They can no longer make the same assumptions about the world they once could. As a result of these experiences that come with having a parent on death row, or a significant other on death row, these children are typically deal with a variety of mental health issues. For instance, they tend to be very anxious, suffer from panic attacks, and display symptoms of depression. They may further exhi exhibit symptoms of PTSD, social phobia, suicidal ideation, and substance abuse. In addition, they may disassociate in an attempt to keep from feeling their own pain, in which they detach from their feelings and live in a numb state. They may demonstrate behavior problems and are often highly aggressive as they harbor a great deal of anger. They display symptoms of trauma, including insomnia, excessive rumination, particularly those children who were witnesses to the murder that was committed by their parent. There are um, examples that I could share with you, but I will save them for um, later comments in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Jones. Thank you for all of your comments and questions, many of uh, which I have to respond, but I will respond to a couple that stand out for me. Um, representative from Italy noted that, um, and it, I have certainly found it to be the case, that the death penalty does create new offenders when these children. Um, I have several examples of that. Many of the particularly young boys, um, a comment was also directed around about gender. I found that specifically with the young boys of the men on death row. There are extreme anger issues, and um, more times than not, I've seen them in and out of juvenile facilities, and there are several right now that I know who are facing um, some serious time for assault. Um, there is a gentleman named um, Hameen who was executed in my state, um, and then shortly afterwards, within the year, his 19-year-old son, who attempted suicide twice, and was institutionalized, then became very angry and homicidal, and now serves life without the possibility of parole for murder. And that's another extreme case. So certainly that is a concern that by um, these children are reoffending um, along the lines of their parent. Um, 
Another good point that was made by um, Representative from France is that you know, there are victims' families who do oppose the death penalty. In fact, there are organizations in the states, such as MVFR, Murder Victims Families for Reconciliation, to give opportunity for these victims' family members to be outspoken against the death penalty. I think that the, such organizations, where they exist, and such individuals where they exist, murder victims' family members who oppose the death penalty, can be helpful to these children to the extent that they are allowed to have um, contact with these children and speak with them directly in the case of their loved one. Unfortunately, we find all too often that the uh, families uh, families of the uh, defendant facing a death sentence are forbidden to have contact with the families of the murder victim's family, the, the murdered victim, uh, throughout the course of the trial and even years beyond. However, in the case where there can be some reconciliation between the two families, I think that should be something that should be encouraged. Um, Representative from Algeria asks the question if uh, people sentenced to the death penalty um, consider uh, would be one more consideration in promoting a moratorium on the death penalty and I would submit that that certainly with all of the issues that we've been hearing today about the impact the extreme negative impact of having a loved one a parent or otherwise on death row for the children certainly that would be um, a just reason for um, a moratorium. Very briefly, uh, I'll say one more comment before I pass on to another panelist. The Penal Reform International uh, made the uh, good point that there are cases where these children still suffer beyond their parent um, being on death row. Perhaps the parent has been commuted to a uh, life sentence or um, maybe even exonerated back into society regardless of the outcome. The eventual outcome, if their parent is not executed, those children still have needs that are neglected that need to be attended to. Um, the, um, there may be a backlash, for instance, um, a, against the family if the parent is commuted to life because there may be some political um, consequences to, uh, around that case. Thank you very much.